You know, that's a really good question for us to consider, and um, it's one that we're thinking through at all eight of our regional campuses. Uh, Have we lost our sense of urgency about what we're supposed to be doing as a church? Have we lost our sense of urgency about what we're supposed to be doing as a church? Now, when I say the word urgency, I don't know what you think, uh, but one of my first thoughts about urgency is when I was a teenager and my dad would ask me to do something. Dad may say, take out the trash. Dad may say, clean up your room. Dad may say, come here, I need to talk to you. And I wish I had been more responsive more times than not, but oftentimes it took me a little jump start to get going. And I would hear Dad's feet on the hardwood floor, or I would see him across the room get up out of his chair to say it again. And for whatever reason, I now had a sense of urgency about whatever it was I was supposed to do that I did not have before. Now, one of the things that motivated me to have a sense of urgency was an obligation. I need to respect and obey him because by obeying those authority figures in our life, we show God that we trust and obey him. But I didn't want to just do it out of guilt and obligation, and I don't want to live that way either. If the church has lost its sense of urgency about what we exist to do, and we want to get that back, which I'm going to make the assumption we we do want to be about what we're supposed to be about, I don't want it to ever be because we feel guilty or obligated or because someone on the platform stood up and called us to respond to something. I want our sense of urgency to be out of the overflow of what the person of Jesus Christ has done for us and our motivation to be because he has loved us and empowered us to act on his behalf that we go so that others might find what we have discovered in Jesus, which has changed everything about our lives. And I want you to see when we talk about a sense of urgency how Jesus said this is one of the most important things for the local church, especially now in North America, to be focused on as we stay focused on the work of his kingdom. Would you stand with me in honor of God's word? And we're going to read from John chapter 9, verses 1 through 11 together. This is a true story from God's word, John chapter 9, and we're going to read verses 1 through 11 together. It says, As he, that's Jesus, was passing by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. We must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world." After Jesus said these things, he spit on the ground and made some mud from the saliva. He spread the mud on the man's eyes. Go, Jesus told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he left, he washed, and he came back seeing. His neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, Isn't this the one who used to sit begging? Some said, yes, that's the guy. And others were saying, no, but he looks like him. And he kept saying, I'm the one. So they asked him, then how were your eyes opened? And the man answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and told me to go wash in the pool of Siloam. So when I went and washed... I received my sight. Isn't this the man who had been born blind? Then how were your eyes opened? The man called Jesus made mud, put it on my eyes, and told me to go washed. I heard Jesus, I believed Jesus, and I received my sight. Lord God, we ask that you would speak in a way that our hearts and minds can hear from you clearly, because that's our greatest desire in this moment. 
We say this and pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, I say quite often that what we do when we are gathered on Sunday mornings for the one hour or so we are here in this place is important. But I also tell you that the other 167 hours of your week are just as equally important. That's why we keep that sign on the wall over there, so that visually it will be on our hearts and on our minds. And if you've ever wondered, where does Aaron get that? Where does it say 1 over 168 in Scripture? I can't show you a passage that has that fraction. But what Jesus is saying here that gave life to that gave life to that mission, is right here in these verses. Jesus said that you need to be about the work of the kingdom. There is work that the church needs to be doing, and you need to be doing it not only when you gather and what happens in the building on Sundays, but outside of these walls. Now, when Jesus says work, he's not talking about us working so that we will gain approval from Jesus. Let me just start right there by saying this is not a works-based salvation. For many of us, we have come to faith in Jesus, and then we were liberated from the false assumption that we needed to earn God's favor. You can't do that. But how benevolent is our God that he gives you his favor in the person of Jesus Christ so that you and I measure up and are pleasing and presentable to him, and we find wholeness and we find new life in the person of Jesus. And so this is not working or being about the work of God to gain his favor, but because we have it, we work out of the overflow of that. And I'd suggest to you that if we could understand that and grasp that and live that way, it would make such a difference in our relationships, make such a difference in our career pursuits, if we worked out of the overflow of having approval from God rather than trying to gain it through others or through acquiring things. And what God is saying here through the person of Jesus Christ as he preaches and teaches in his earthly ministry is you need to be about the work of the kingdom and you need to have a sense of urgency about it. And when Jesus says this, he says right here in verse 4, we need to do the works of him who sent me. That's be about the work of God because night is coming when no one will be able to do the work. Night is coming when no one will be able to do the work. There is sun, there is day, there is darkness, there is night. The church must work with a sense of urgency that the daylight is running out to do the work of God here on this planet. Now Jesus went on to say, night is coming when no one can work. And as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Now sure enough, Jesus lived to about 33 years old when he laid down his life in exchange for the sinful brokenness of humanity. And at that point on the cross, and when we place our faith in him, what he accomplished for us is he laid down his perfect reputation so that when you place your faith in Jesus, you take up his. So when we sung these songs about the, death has no, the grave has no hold over us, death has no final claim on us, there's second chances, there's forgiveness, there's do-overs, it was made possible through the person of Jesus and his finished work on the cross. Then Jesus resurrected Jesus, spent about 40 days with the disciples on the earth, and then he ascended into heaven. And when Jesus left this planet, he didn't take the light of God away with him. When Jesus left, the light wasn't extinguished. Now, what Jesus' mission was is to bring light to the darkness. And how many of us enjoy being in darkness? How many of us enjoy being in rooms or spaces where there's no light and it's dark? Uh, it's clumsy. You bump into furniture. You can't find the light switch. Uh, you don't have clarity or depth perception. We don't really enjoy being in darkness physically or spiritually. When we're in darkness spiritually, we're often confused about what our purpose is in life. Why am I here and what is the meaning of being here? Jesus came to shed light on those questions and Jesus is answering questions. Not only then, but now Jesus is answering questions that we're asking and only he can answer those questions. So Jesus says, there is a time coming when I will leave this earth. And while I'm here on this earth, I will be about the Lord's business. When I leave this earth, the Father will send the Holy Spirit. And for those of us who live on this side of the resurrection and the ascension, we know that the light of God is in this world through the work of the Spirit. When we placed our faith in Jesus, we discovered that. It brought illumination to our life. It brought purpose and meaning. Jesus is not saying that when he ascended into heaven, the light would cease to be. 
He's simply saying, I'm keenly aware that my physical being here on this earth is limited. There's a window of time that I will be here. He is 100% God. Jesus did not give up any of his divinity to come to earth. But he's saying, I'm also 100% human. I know what it's like to have a tough day. I know what it's like when friends, what it's like when friends betray you. I know what it's like to be made fun of, spit at, jeered at. If that's how you feel, you've had one of those seasons of life, that's what it means for Jesus to have been human. He is different than any other purported God on the planet. And he says, even though that's reality, it has a window. It's coming to a conclusion. And at 33 years old, it did. Jesus is saying, I'm keenly aware that I need to have a sense of urgency about the work. But Jesus didn't only say, I need to have a keen awareness and urgency about being about bringing light to darkness. You need to have a keen awareness of bringing light to darkness. That's one of the things he says in verse 4. We must be about the work of the Father while there is time. We need to have a sense of urgency. And remember, not out of guilt or obligation, but out of a delight and a joy about sharing that light of Jesus with others. I think one of the reasons there's not a sense of urgency, this is my personal opinion, you can disagree with it. I think there's one of the reasons there's not a great sense of urgency about sharing the light of Jesus in our life with others is because many of us have come to faith in Christ, but it stopped at salvation, like our growth stopped at salvation. We haven't seen spiritual breakthroughs. We haven't surrendered our relationships or our careers to Jesus and seen him answer prayers, maybe not in the way we wanted, but in a way where we knew it was Jesus and we knew he was being good to us. So we are not growing. We are not disciples. We know Jesus, but we're not becoming more like him. So we don't have a whole lot to share with anybody else. That's one of the reasons community is so important. Last Sunday, over 75 individuals connected and engaged a Bible reading group, a life group, a mentor relationship. It's one of the ways that you can be encouraged to grow in your personal relationship with Jesus. And God said that he wanted us to be about this work because the time is limited. Jesus said that. He says we need to be about that. And it's true. It is so true the time is limited. Jesus ascended into heaven, but one day he will return. And Jesus said, even I don't know when that is. The Father's going to send me back. We would call that the second coming because Jesus has already arrived once the second coming. And sometimes in our car or at the home around the breakfast table, it recently happened with my daughter. She said, what will that be like? What will that be like? Like which sky, which area of town? Will the clouds part? Will there be noises? Will we ascend into heaven? Will our neighbors think we're weirdos? Like what's going to happen? Now my first thought was, can, can, can we just eat our cereal first? And buy me a little bit of time to think about how I want to respond to that deeply theological question. But I was able to say quickly, yes, that's going to happen. Because everything else Jesus has promised us has come to fruition. That too will happen. And when it does, that will limit the ability moving forward for us to share the light of Jesus with others. But even more than that, and I don't want us to get caught up on when that is. When that is. There's books and all kind of movies made about when that is. It's going to happen. But maybe even more than that, you and I are not guaranteed the the next 24-hour period. We're not guaranteed when that finite window of life will come to a conclusion. I think James, a follower of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, said this really well. I think James, a follower of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, said this really well. And in James 4.14, in James 4.14, I want to put this on the screen, this is what he said. In James 4.14, he said, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. You do not know what will happen in your life. For you're like a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. And for somebody in this room, you're like, this is the worst sermon I've ever heard in my life. It's so discouraging. Maybe you had a really good cup of coffee. I drank some community coffee this weekend, went to seminary in New Orleans. I like my coffee thick, like sap in the dead of winter. Had a little fig bar, a little fig bar this morning, feeling pretty good. My morning's going good. Maybe you did too. Maybe, maybe you're keto. Maybe you did something else this morning, okay? But your morning's going good until you showed up here. And I said, mm, well, here's the deal. Your life is going to come to a conclusion. But you know what's interesting? God may have woken you up to bring you here to remind you of that stark reality. And instead of us viewing it as like, how depressing, how discouraging. Here, here's what I know about Jesus. Because he loves us, he'll always tell us the truth. People who love you will tell you the truth. And some of the greatest mistakes I've ever made in my life say, I don't have any regrets. I got regrets. <laughs> Lord's forgiven me. I still got regrets. 
And, and some of those biggest mistakes I ever made was I surrounded myself with people who told me what I wanted to hear. That's on me. That's on me. i got to own that. And it's hard to surround yourself with people that will tell you the truth because sometimes it stings and you don't want to hear it and you just want people to give you permission to make the choices. And, what... and because Jesus loves you, he will tell you the truth. And one of the things he says is you may not have as much time as you think you do. I know someone who was killed in a car wreck last weekend. I'm pretty sure when they got in the car, they weren't thinking this is it. I don't say that to scare you. And if you know me, I'm not passive aggressive or manipulative. I'm not trying to make anybody be like, oh my gosh, is he looking at me? Does he know something I don't know? No, the answer is no. I do not, okay? Don't send me an email like, that's, that's not right of you to play the Lord. I'm not trying to. I'm just telling you, you may not have as much time as you think you do. And you're not guaranteed the next breath. And so the church needs to be about taking the light of Jesus, the hope that we have in him to others, because you don't know when your life will come to a conclusion. But the other side of that coin is this. If you're not a follower of Jesus, and I'm talking about the mission of Jesus and doing the works of God, and you're like, I, I don't even believe in Jesus. I'm not even there. The other side of that coin is you may not have time. Same message. You may not have as much time as you think you do. You may not have as much time as you think you do. And one of the reasons, like it was mentioned in the video that showed right before this, but about 120 years ago, local churches started having a public invitation in a worship service. I don't know how many of you are, are used to and familiar with public invitations. But at the end of the sermon, the pastor would talk about, you may not have as much time as you think you do. And if you do not know Jesus, you will be separated him from etern for all eternity from the love of God. And he will honor your decision not to choose to follow him. That's one of the hardest realities about the person of Jesus. It's also one of the most loving realities about Jesus. He will not force you to love him. And by the way, I mean, do you really want anybody to love you because you forced them to? No. There's even a story about a rich young ruler who asked Jesus, what do I need to do? And Jesus tells him, and he's like, ooh, that's hard. <laughs> that's hard. I don't know if I want to do that. And Jesus, this is, this is sad, but it's truthful. Jesus let this guy walk away. And even if you don't choose to follow Jesus, you've got to appreciate and respect the reality that he won't force somebody, he won't manipulate them to choose him. And so pastors would literally, at the end of the service, they'd come down and they'd stand in front of the congregation. And everyone would sing, and, and for the song of response, the pastor would be down front. And as they sung, he was waiting to receive anyone who said, I don't want to leave this room without getting right with Jesus. I've got some stuff going on, I need to talk to somebody. Now, when I was in middle school, and it hasn't changed, I'm 40, 42, 42, I almost forgot how old I was. I'm 42. Like, it's going already, right? Whether I was 12, 22, 32, or 42, like, I, I, I'd be in a service, somebody does that, and the pastor would look at me, and I'd be like, oh my gosh, he's looking at me. What does he know that I don't know? Like, oh my gosh, don't look at me, don't look at me. And so I'd look away. I don't know if that fact mortifies you of public invitation. I don't know if you feel like, it ain't no way I'm stepping out in front of everybody and walking down there, even if I wanted to. That, that's... Bible talks about spiritual warfare. It's legit. Because the enemy would rather you be quiet. He is like a lion that just roars around looking for prey to pick off. And if he can isolate you, anybody watch National Geographic? Anybody? <laughs> right? Anybody binge watching that instead of tidying up? Anybody? Anybody watching National Yeah, I watch it too. I've been watching Netflix. Yeah, all right. But you, keeping things inside, not sharing with anybody, and just dying inside because you're afraid what other people will think or embarrassed that somebody might know you're working through an issue. Guess what? I got issues too. Everybody in this room is broken and flawed. The question is to what extent and because of what choices. And then we work forward from there. But the pastor would stand here, and, and so he, as we would sing, he would look. And, you know, we kind of moved away from that in churches. Like, we don't technically do that here. People do respond in faith. Last Sunday... Last Sunday, somebody came to faith in Christ. Throughout the week, the six days in between Sunday services, people are coming to faith in Jesus Christ to this congregation. So that is happening. We praise God for that. But the reason we kind of moved away from it is because oftentimes in some churches, pastors unintentionally or intentionally let that chorus go on three verses and four verses and five verses and 88 verses till somebody responded. And many of us grew up in churches where you nudge your friend, you're like, somebody make a decision today so we can all go home. <laughs> I think that's why some churches moved away from it, because it, it did turn manipulative, not all, and I, I'm not criticizing it, but it, it was guilt-based maybe. I get that. But I also want to tell you this. I think in the process of moving away from that, we muted the urgency of the moment. 
we muted and undermined the urgency of the moment that you're not guaranteed tomorrow. And even if you stand right here as a pastor and no one comes forward, still standing here to lock eyes with the congregation and for us to think at the same moment, at the same time in worship, we need to be about the Lord's business. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. I need to respond in faith to what God calls me to do. I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. I don't want to put this off because by the way, if you don't respond in the room, the percentages drop precipitously that you'll actually do something with what you intend to do. I give you exhibit A. I used to sign up for small groups at churches when I was in college, and on Sunday, pastor would make a moving sermon, and I'd know I need to be in biblical communion. I'd sign up, and then like the staff would reach out, and I'd like ghost them. Oh my gosh, it felt so much better on Sunday. I was like worked up in the spirit, like I really got to commit now. If anyone's ever done that, and you have ghosted our emails, no judgment, but I give you exhibit A. Flesh being what it is, we, we don't want to hold to our commitment that felt didn't only feel right, we knew it was right in the moment. I wonder if we got away from the urgency because we don't practice things like that. But I want to show you what happened. Not only that we need to realize that the moment calls for action, but just look at the blind man. Just look at the blind man and what he did. Jesus says to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. And the man left he washed, and he came back seeing. He left, he washed, and he came back seeing. He most likely didn't have all his questions answered. He might have had questions like, why mud? That's so weird. I can't see anyway, buddy. <laughs> like, what's going on? He may have questions. He might have had concerns. He might have thought, this is weird. I do that too sometimes. Why does Jesus say this? Why did he choose to do this and not that? But like all Jesus says is, I came to bring light to darkness. And by the way... Throughout the book of John, every time Jesus heals somebody, when he meets a physical need, it's to address a spiritual problem that's greater and bigger. Jesus will often address a physical need for the purpose. He'll always address a physical need for the purpose of helping resolve and address a spiritual problem. Because the man may be physically blind, but as best we can tell, he doesn't know Jesus before this moment doesn't know Jesus before this moment. And what if Jesus answered every one of our prayers in this room? And they're legit. I'm not minimizing any of them. They're legit. Maybe it is a physical infirmity. Maybe it's sight. Maybe it's well-being. Maybe it's an answered prayer. What if Jesus answered all of that, but we don't know him spiritually, and we don't have any greater confidence, joy, excitement, meaning, or purpose in this life, but Jesus addressed what we asked him for, but we didn't get what our soul needed, which was to be made whole to be made whole, to be made well spiritually. Because this body will come to a conclusion on this earth, but our soul will live forever. And what God wants is to be in relationship with us for all eternity, not only now, but in the life to come. And so Jesus heals this man. And the man had a lot of questions, and it wasn't convenient to run to the pool of Siloam, but he did it. And he comes back seeing. And when he comes back, by the way, if you do what Jesus asks you to do, there will be naysayers. There will be people that would love to criticize your obedience. And the line between faith and insanity sometimes is razor thin. Did Jesus really ask me to move to Seoul, South Korea to be on mission with him? Our preschool and children's minister is literally planning and preparing next month to move to Seoul, South Korea to go into full-time global missions. Did God really ask me to start this Bible study in my workplace? There are women and men in this room who have started gospel-centered Bible studies that have brought hope and meaning to people that might not have ever come into a worship service. You're like, did God really call me to do this? And there'll be people like, oh, they're all religious. They're all pious. She missed the calling. Like, if you choose to respond to Jesus, there will be people that will be critical. And this guy is healed. He can see. And people are like, who did this to you? Who did this to you? By what authority? And who allowed this? How about we have a party that this dude can see? Somebody stand back and say, buddy, let me, let me take you out for coffee and let's talk about this because that's phenomenal. But that's not how the flesh works. That's not how the world works. And so when they criticize him, the guy says, listen, listen, listen. You can talk about the guy that healed me all you want. But all I know is this. I was blind and now I see. And in the history of humanity, he says in verses 30 through 33 of this chapter, because I know you're going to go home and at some point this week, before we come back together, you're going to read all of chapter 9 because you're like, this is like incredible. It's crazy. I'm going to read this. And you're going to see in verses 30 through 39, the man says this. 
In the history of humanity, no one has helped a blind man see, and this guy did. And he wouldn't have been able to do it unless he was from God. This dude is from God. I am professing he's the one we've been waiting on. I was blind, and now I see. I'm physically healed, but I spiritually have found the light. And Ronnie, I love that song, I Saw the Light. I've heard you play that before in years past, like, I don't need to be singing it. They don't need to hear me sing it, but sometime let's sing it. Like He's like, I saw the light physically and spiritually. Keep praying about the things you want to see God do in your life, but also know this. The Lord wants to bring you light spiritually to illuminate what is dark, to make plain what is confused, to bring clarity and confidence about what is frustrating That's what he came to do. And the man didn't know everything, but he responded with a sense of urgency. That's about as straightforward as it gets. He heard, he put his faith in the words of Jesus, and he found his sight. The man had a sense of urgency about responding, and it changed his life. So here is one of the things that I want us to be praying about as a congregation. Again, tonight we've got a night of prayer from 5 to 6 o'clock. Show up, pray about this. If you can't show up, pray about this. Pray. Some of you are literally turning in your journals. It's beautiful. Write this down and pray it every day. Pray that this congregation would have a sense of urgency about taking the light of Jesus to others because we're not guaranteed tomorrow and they aren't either. Pray about that. Pray that we as a congregation would not be motivated by guilt or obligation. And I'm going to say this. This applies to me. I'm not preaching to you. I'm talking about me. I I pray that I would want to do that because I have been, I'm, I'm jacked up and flawed apart from Jesus. I know where my life goes without him in my life. And I am going to pray that I will be compelled with a sense of urgency about the mission of God because I have been washed in the blood of a perfect Savior who cleaned me up, presented me to his Father, and said, look at him. He's got my reputation. He now has my righteousness. He has been brought close to you again. And now I can encourage others to find that in Jesus as well. I pray that that's why we would do that. Pray for those things. But here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Pray this as well. Pray that any woman or man in this congregation who's leaning in, dusting for God's fingerprints in their life, that they would hear the call of Jesus on their life and respond. Pray that people would respond to the ministry and the message of Jesus. Pray that. If you're not praying for the salvation of people who are lost, you need to. You need to be praying about that. 1.2, 1.7, 1.8. I hear a new number every week about how many people live in Nashville. Next week, somebody's been like, there are 10 million people here. Did you know that? Like, whatever, man. We just know there's a lot. <laughs> but we also know that any metric you want to look at, about 75 to 85% of the people in Nashville do not believe in Jesus. They do not know him. They're looking for physical healing, but they also lack spiritual healing. And we desire for them to know Jesus and to discover what we have. So pray for people who do not know him. Well, I think that would be a great thing to do right now. I think that would be a great thing to do right now as a congregation. So let me encourage you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment.